and welcome to our first presentation of the year. I'm uh, Brent Taylor and I'm the convener of the speaker program for the Military and History and Heritage Victoria. On behalf of the committee, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's Zoom event. Tonight, we're pleased to have Harry Moffat pre presenting 11 Bats, a story of uh, combat cricket and the SAS. Now, a little bit about Harry. Um, you probably know him fairly well from his articles in the newspaper, but um, a bit more detail. Harry spent more than 20 years in the SAS. Uh, his decades of service and multiple tours in East Timor, Iraq and Afghanistan made him one of the regiment's most experienced and recognised figures. Alongside the SAS, Harry's other lifetime love is cricket, and Harry will explain how he wove his work in the SAS in, uh, with cricket during the 11 deployments. Harry completed his time in the SAS as its human performance manager. He's a registered sports psychologist and runs human perform performance consultancy working with sports teams, military and industry. He remains a, a cricket tragic. A little bit of pro process before Harry begins. Now you'll be familiar with most of it, but I'll just remind you. Uh, Harry will be answering questions at the end of the presentation on the subject of 11 bats or any other topic related to the SAS or in fact any other thing he tells us. Um, I'll invite your, you to send questions via chat message anytime up to and including question time. You can do this by clicking on the chat icon in the middle button of the bottom of the Zoom panel, address the question to everyone. When the time comes, I will read your question using your first name. Now, Harry's also um, indicated that he's willing to go open mic. Uh, and we've never tried that before. So we'll try that um, after we've read out the, the listed questions. So um, that'll be quite uh, an interesting um, experience. Uh, Harry is happy to have your screens on, but remember that everyone can also see you and they can also hear you if your microphone switched on. So please switch them off. By now you should be in speaker view and I invite Harry to speak. Thanks very much, Brent. And uh, thanks for having me along and, and welcome everybody. Uh, it's a privilege to be the first speaker for the year. And uh, I'm sure you get uh, many interesting speakers. I hope I can set a good uh, benchmark for, uh, for 2022. Excuse my croaky voice. Uh, I play in a band with a couple of uh, SAS guys and we had a few gigs on the weekend. So uh, uh, I'm not a particularly good singer, but I gave it my best shot. And uh, But I think we'll get through today. Um, I'll, uh, I'll start by sharing my screen and uh, kick it off. Um, I guess... You know, a lot of questions about how does cricket and the SAS kind of fit together and, and, and my, my service. Uh, that's my aim today really is to give you a bit of a background on myself, uh, on, uh, on how cricket stitched into my service and how important it was to, I'll give you a bit of an insight into the role that cricket plays just beyond novelty. Um, it's been around with uh, the diggers in the First World War and the Second World War, the Vietnam, Korea, etc. It's, it's flowed all through service and sports, such an important um, vehicle in which we can connect and, and recover as well. Uh, it's a great way to, uh, to relax and, and recover after you know, what can be a very traumatic experience at times. Um, I'll share some... Uh, uh, pull back the, 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 the curtain, so to speak, and, and share a few insights that you might not get anywhere else. So just apply kind of Chatham House rules uh, as much as we can. I understand we're recording, that's okay. And the other thing I'll say too is that there's no questions off, off limits. Um, I have written publicly about uh, my thoughts around what's happening in the SAS at the moment. So I'm very happy uh, to take any questions beyond what you may have already read through the articles in the Australian, et cetera. So for the next uh, 30 or 40 minutes, I hope you enjoy uh, a few images uh, and uh, take you through what has been, you know, at times a bit of a surreal uh, career and uh, anyone who's had a life of service would understand that. And I know that it will resonate with the audience today being uh, historians and, uh, and keepers of, of Australia's military story, which uh, I really respect and, and uh, thank you all for doing that. The 11 bats, um, well, 
really it was my habit on each deployment that I went away. Uh, indeed, uh, whenever I went away on training or wherever I went in the world to take a cricket bat with me, it's a unique sport uh, in that it's not ubiquitous across the world, particularly if you think about uh, uh, nations that we serve with, whether they be European nations, uh, the US in particular, cricket's still quite an enigma. Um, Canada, we, we do a lot of work with the Canadian Special Forces or Special Operations. Um, and my habit was to take a bat and the bats uh, resemble uh, or come to symbolise my service. And particularly from 2000 to 2015, over 11 deployments and really 11 years encapsulated in that, uh, I took a bat on the deployment. We would play cricket. All of them have been outside the wire, uh, so to speak. And at the end of my deployment, I'd have the men and women that I served with sign the bats as is customary. Um, and the bats you see in front of you have the, the signatures of the men and women I served with, uh, uh, some of who are, who are no longer with us have been killed in action along the way, uh, many wounded in action. Um, but also they have dignitaries, uh, politicians, uh, various generals from different uh, coalition forces, you know, Stanley McChrystal's on, on there, um, uh, governors general, uh, prime ministers from the period from 2000 onwards, um, but also some, you know, what we might have called at times our, our, uh, our foe, uh, for example, the team Marie's bat that you can see in the middle, the white MC Michael Clark uh, Slazinger, um, fifth from the left uh, on that bat has uh, Janana Guzmao, uh, Ramos Horda, uh, uh, Mario Katiri, and um, the antagonist of the Timor um, uh, period uh, was uh, Alfredo Renato, who actually grew to uh, share a friendship with. And he was the guy who was the biggest troublemaker of the lot of them. And he and I shared bottles of wine, cigarettes and evenings together. And I found him to be quite a sophisticated, passionate man who just wanted the best for his country. And he really had a be in his bonnet about the politicians and the, and the bureaucrats that uh, uh, got in the way of progressing the nation. Um, and his story is pretty tragic. Uh, you know, uh, only a year after I spent time with him in the hills of Timor, uh, he was uh, assassinated essentially uh, and uh, was was killed, and I think that in the in, in the historical sense was a good thing, in that he was taken off the board. But um, it's not to un, um, you know, forget uh, the passion and the effort that he put into trying to save his nation. So there's a there's a raft of signatures on there. Probably the the, the uh, most curious of the signatures is on the bat, uh, second from the right with the green handle. Um, on top there, we've got uh, Prince Philip and Prince Harry's signatures, which I find um, quite unique. They don't often sign much. Prince Philip was a bit of a grumpy old fella, but uh, it was nice to get his signature before his, um, his, recent, uh, his recent passing. Um, I like to start every story with, you know, just connecting the past to the present. You know, uh, the, the Harry Moffat in 1916 was a, was a, was a man, a teacher from, from Ballarat, Bendigo area in Victoria, uh, joined up with everybody else. He was in his early 30s, uh, was a lieutenant, and he was killed in July 20 uh, in uh, 1916 at Fromel, the Battle of Fromel, which is, you know, synonymous with Australian military history, probably Australia's darkest night or day ever in, uh, in, in our whole history where uh, um, uh, Australia done us proud and, and um, uh, were part of a feint to the north of the, uh, of the, 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 um, the, the battle lines of World War I. And Har Harry Moffat was killed in the first assault uh, in Fromel in daylight as he topped the bags, he was machine gunned and killed, um, trying to rescue other, other blokes. And then cast forward a hundred years to Harry Moffat 2016, which is the, the year that I hung up my helmet. It's just behind me here up on the, uh, on the mantelpiece. Uh, when I retired or I was asked to retire because I was getting too old, I, I could have gone around again, but uh, I was happily happy to retire on my own terms. And I always make the point that Harry Moffat 2016 on the right there, there's more technology on that gun helmet and body than there probably was on the whole of the Western 
battlefield uh, of uh, Western Europe in, uh, in 1916. They had a few balloons, planes and tanks were only just starting to emerge. But my, my gun there on the right, my helmet can talk to space. It's, it's talking via satellite communications. It can geolocate you on the ground to within a, a few meters. Uh, and the communications was um, strong, whether it was within the teams immediately around you or back to Australia. So it's an amazing thing, but I always like to think that no matter how much technology has changed in warfare, one thing remains the same, and that's the, the values and the philosophies and the reason that we, we go to war. And uh, people ask me, would you do it again? You know, I didn't exactly agree with the Iraq uh, campaign, uh, but I would because my mission statement has always been, and I think most soldiers are the same, that I'll go anywhere in the world to protect the vulnerable against you know, bullies and, and, and uh, uh, excuse my language, but arseholes. So uh, I, I don't think anything's changed between Harry Moffat 1916 and Harry Moffat 2016 in that endeavor to, to uh, protect the vulnerable against people who would do ill of them. Where it all started for me uh, was in, uh, some of you might recognize this photo, I'm sure you all do. Uh, this is uh, 22 SAS assaulting the um, Iranian embassy of Princess Gate in London in 1980. And I was 12 years old and, and I remember seeing this image in black and white on the front pages of the papers, on the news. And I didn't know what was going on, but I just it welded onto my brain. I thought, whatever's going on there, I'm absolutely mad for it. I, whatever they're doing, I, I want to be a part of it. And it set about a chain of events in my life that changed forever. Up until that stage, it was quite a poor family. Uh, I was uh, uh, hoping to become a carpenter, maybe run out of full Ford for Hawthorne. Uh, at some stage, I love my footy and, and, and cricket or play cricket for Australia. But this set off a chain of events for me that led me to the military and to the SAS ultimately. Uh, it, it inspired me to read. Uh, I read a lot about uh, you know, Northern Ireland, World War I, World War II. Uh, I was not much of a reader until this point, and I've been a, a voracious reader ever since. And these are four people that really inspired me as a 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 year old, as a teenager. And you'll recognize most of them immediately. Uh, top left, Albert Jacker, one of the great Australians, Mayor of St Kilda, some of his social reforms that he uh, uh, set up in St Kilda still exist today, and a man with a huge legacy. Uh, and, a, and by all accounts, a, a, a ripping person as well. Uh, bottom right is um, David Sterling, who set up the first SAS uh, organization. You know, he'd had a few beers and he, he scratched out a few um, uh, chicken scratchings on the back of a, of a notepad outlining what he, what he wanted to do, his vision, and, and he was given the, the remit to do it. And I mean, it goes without saying the SAS now are a, a major brand or logo globally. So we owe a debt of gratitude to a, a young Catholic officer who, uh, who had a dream and, um, and look what it's become. Probably not so well known, well, are they also well, so well known um, down the bottom, the white mouse, uh, you, you, you know, you talk about military inspiration and military leaders. Uh, the, 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 the she commanded, you know, some people say 6,000, some people say 60,000 um, people in the French resistance uh, and uh, mostly by message and by com in, you know, uh, dispersed communication and inspired a generation alongside others. There were many others, uh, she wasn't the only one, um, but really inspired me uh, to, to read more and dig more into special operations and being, being a, you know, it's being okay to be a different soldier and think differently. And then up top right, uh, you might not know, Percy Serity, who uh, was, a, was a scientist really, he changed the face of uh, sports science, um, nutrition, um, how, how athletes behave socially, uh, how they train. Runners were trained in the gym and, and light lifters were trained to run, had never been done before. Um, and Percy Serity changed um, in his own way, uh, sports science forever, and it was a real pivotal point. So these are, these are four people and, that, that really inspired me. 
and they really do uh, today still inspire me and, and have, have made the fabric of who I feel like I've become. That's not to under, uh, uh, underestimate my father's and my mother's input who were a huge uh, influence on me, both, uh, both people of service as well. My father was in the Navy and my mother was a, was a nurse, lifelong nurse. So uh, I feel like I've had a great uh, uh, beginning and, and a bit of luck too. You, you kind of are inspired along the way serendipitously almost. Um, I joined the Army in 1986, uh, and it wasn't long before my mission to join the SAS, which is what it was all about. Uh, in 1990, I, I uh, enlisted uh, my intent to attempt SAS selection course, and in 1990, I did that and was lucky enough to, to make it through to the end, and I feel a great privilege to be able to don the, the Sandy Beret and serve for the, for the unit. Uh, this is an image of a soldier overlooking the uh, Stirling Ranges in the southwest of, of Western Australia. Uh, and about halfway through the selection course, about a month long selection course, uh, you do a solo track, five days, five peaks of those you see in front of you through some of the toughest um, uh, 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 terrain that I've ever uh, had the, I suppose, a displeasure of uh, having to negotiate. It is thick, uh, super thick. It's only probably, you know, three or four metres high all through there, but it's just thick and dense. And, you know, for every kilometre, you've really got to work hard. And we lose most of our candidates on this five days of the whole the whole month. And it's just, it's, it's etched into my fabric every time I remember back to those days. And, you know, I, I, I talk to guys now and they say, what was the toughest thing you've done? And they reflect back on, on what we call then or still call happy wanderer. And I can tell you, there's nothing happy about those five days. Uh, you, you're starved and you're not sleeping very well and you're working super hard during the day with 50 kilos of kit carrying it around. Um, so this is a formative moment in my life. And I love this image. It really does capture the journey that I was about to go on. Uh, and that this soldier in front of you, and today still our SAS soldiers, part of their selection is they need to negotiate that five, uh, five day, five peak um, uh, test. I, uh, I went into a troop, I was way too young. I, I joined the SAS very young. Uh, I really struggled for the first few years just to keep up, just to keep up with the tough older men. You know, they're in their late thirties, early forties and they're hardened they're like old rope, old boots, you know, they're just super tough. And I was this green, um, you know, uh, uh, wet-eared, uh, young, skinny bloke. I was, I was pretty skinny all the way through and, and copped a bit of stick for that. Uh, but I, I managed to get through the next two years. Once you finish selection, you then have like a two-year university cycle to go through. Uh, I, I still think it's one of the toughest universities on the planet, uh, certainly in Australia. Uh, it's back-to-back -back courses you do. Um, communications, language, uh, surgery, you know, the medical goes beyond just first aid and advanced first aid to, to basic surgery and S8 drugs. Um, and we are fully self-sufficient. We can look after ourselves and can take care of some pretty nasty uh, things and also service uh, locals in terms of medical provision. Um, and the unit's kind of broken up into to, to four main areas now which is you know, pretty well known. Uh, we have a, a top right a long range vehicle patrol uh, capability. We can do 40, 50, 60 days independently in any, any part of the world on vehicles. We, we have, we're trained to fix cars, to keep cars running. We have some of the best vehicles on the planet uh, and we're self-sustained, water, bomb, uh, uh, ammunition, food, everything. We can go out forever. And it's kind of our calling card. Whenever they need a desert um, capability, uh, the first door they knock on is Australia because that's a, that's the thing we're most proud of. We also do parachute operations. and We take it to an extreme. We jump at night from 30,000 feet with oxygen and we can transit up to 30 kilometres over the ocean. Or, or, or land, if you can imagine landing on the Solomon Islands, we can be dropped off over the horizon 30 kilometers and then, and then uh, um, float in uh, by parachute to, to the island to uh, be undetected and it's still maintained today. Uh, we also diving capability, underwater rebreathing, so we can swim in harbors, we can swim in the middle of the ocean. Uh, we're the go-to 
uh, organization for underwater submarine release and uh, other submarine. That's kind of, we make the submarine so important in Australia. A lot of people say, oh, we've only got a few submarines. What do we need them for? And they cost so much money. Well, one of the main roles and probably top three or even top two roles at the submarine service is getting the SAS around the planet. Uh, and we train hard in that regard. And then the last one is, um, not, you know, again, pretty well known now is our out of uniform, uh, our out of uniform roles. Um, people say, oh, you ever speak all the languages and, and you can cut around and, and pretend to be a local. You can't. There's no way in the world, even if you had four, five, 10 years at, at university learning how to speak Dari or Pashtun or, or any other language, they still pick up on your accent. You know, they can pick an Australian accent out just as we can with um, anyone else who's lived in Australia for a long time. So we, we learn to uh, adapt to our environment in those places, Nairobi, Islamabad, Kabul, wherever in the planet. And uh, we can appear to be uh, locals uh, but it doesn't last too long once you start to engage with people. And then we have trade craft and other, other, other methods. So we're very well renowned in all four corners of these capability. And I like to think that Australia boxes way above, above its weight still today. And, and there's um, individuals in the regiment uh, fulfilling all this capability in the globe as we speak. Uh, the busiest organisation in Australia, I still maintain. Um, for those who don't know, uh, Perth SAS Barracks is based in Perth on the West Coast, and uh, we occupy uh, probably one of the nicest barracks on the planet. It's beautiful. Uh, just spent half a billion dollars redeveloping it, and long may it stay there. It fulfills more than just a barracks to house, you know, a, a few hundred SAS guys. Uh, it's also an OPSEN. It's a massive communication hub to the Indian Ocean and often to the rest of the world. So the ADF. Uh, it's an amazing capability that the SAS provide beyond just a few soldiers. And that's why I'm so passionate about defending the unit in the front of uh, yeah, the allegations that have gone on. Those people will go on to be tried and go through the judicial processes that they should. No one should be held to higher account than, than we should be. Uh, but the capability needs to be maintained and, and I'll fight tooth and nail to the, to the grave to make sure that Australia is offered the best. And, and over here in Perth, they love us. They look after us over there. They're not bad for Western Australians. I'm Victorian and I think it's a great place to, to house our SAS and long may they stay there, as I said. Um, after I left the U, after I finished my um, my reinforcement cycle and was handed the beret. Uh, again, a great privilege and honour to, 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 be, to be allowed to be a steward of that beret. Um, I, it was just uh, back to back to back to back deployments for the rest of my career. I, it kind of feels like it went past in a blink. Um, a lot of people say, oh, you must have faced danger here, there, and, and, and that's true. You know, um, of course you do. You're on the very front lines and further. Uh, forward. Uh, but I think this, this image really captures it for me. Um, this is Baghdad, September uh, 2003, uh, during the heaviest fighting, the heaviest bombing, suicide bombing campaign uh, of, that camp, of that campaign. And daily, hourly, we were being um, you know, rocketed, bombed. Uh, and as we were pulling into the um, the uh, Baghdad International Airport, which hadn't been properly secured at this stage, nor had Baghdad uh, after the shock and awe um, that the US had, had deployed. We were just sitting there waiting to get into the International Airport and two suicide bomber cars drove up beside us and detonated. And as usual, uh, we, we, our car was rendered unserviceable. We limped into the, to the airport. But um, as usual, it's the civilians who, who copped the, the brunt of all of these types of events. So, uh, you know, it's, it's just a super fine line between, um, you know, the mundacity or the boredom of being a soldier or deployed and, and warfare, which is 90% or 99% of it's nothing. You know, it's kind of just sitting around waiting, guessing, etc. And then there's punctuated by these moments of, of terror. And this was really the first time I, I, I had a close call. And I just recall really reflecting on you know, what am I doing <laughs> for a start, but also about the gravity of the situation that we're in and also that the civilians are at the centre of everything we do. That's why we're there. We're there to, we're there to protect them so that uh, those countries can educate their children.
children, look after their women, look after the most vulnerable. And uh, as I said, anything I can do, I, I stand ready now as I speak. Uh, a couple of highlights, I guess. Uh, not, highlights is not the right name, but a couple of things that really stick out with me. Um, I was a parachute uh, master uh, and it was my, my craft, I guess, the, the, the specialty skill that I brought to the, to the unit. Um, uh, probably the, the, the most memorable moment for me as a, a parachute master and leading teams was uh, leading a team of 20 uh, SAS soldiers into the mountains of Afghanistan to catch a, a bad guy. He was equivalent to a general uh, Al Qaeda commander commanded tens of thousands of, uh, of, of troops on the on the grounds. Uh, we've been chasing him for five years and had he'd slipped the net every time. And uh, we conceived an idea to jump in behind the village that he was staying in this night and crawl in and uh, and nab him. And, and uh, we had to do it in one period of darkness. Yet yeah, we had about a two hour window because. They, they don't sleep, they, they sleep during the day and they move on, they use phones, leave the phones there and move to the next village, you know, 100 kilometres away. And that's how they get around without being detected. We landed uh, 20, it's no mean feat to get 20 SAS troops on the side of a mountain without breaking themselves or without um, you know, doing, doing um, without injury, etc. We landed on the ground, we walked through the mountains that night and uh, we caught him and about a dozen of his henchmen um, all without firing a shot. And I guess that's the thing I'm most proud of. The SAS uh, is often misrepresented in the media, almost entirely misrepresented with people jumping out of helicopters and doing all this other stuff. That's not our main job. It never has been. We, uh, we can do that, but it's a small part of our remit. Normally those images are commandos or infantry, et cetera. It just fits the narrative for the media. Our job is to do things in the dark, by stealth, without firing a shot. And in the SAS, we, our, our ethos revolves around the fact that if we have fired a shot, it's normally because we've stuffed up and we've been compromised. Um, and on this night, I think there's no better um, example of that for me than accomplishing the mission, high, high strategic mission and high risk mission without firing a shot and, and uh, realising the results. And that, that had implications that night for globally for, um, for, uh, for the effort in Afghanistan. Uh, hasn't all been, uh, you know, that, that rewarding. Uh, often you will, you know, it's, it goes without saying that um, uh, our colleagues are killed and, and, and injured. I often say that uh, seeing uh, colleagues wounded is worse than seeing them killed uh, because, uh, you know, you can kind of reconcile someone being killed and then you can move quickly onto the next, you know, part of the mission that you're on to and, and retrieve the bodies. But when someone's wounded, it's, it kind of, Get you in a different way, and uh, and and I suppose it brings into relief your own mortality and your own fears, your own physical or mental fears. This morning or this uh, this evening, uh, we just finished a, a series of of long day and night patrols in the Chora Valley, um, the Chora Valley where this picture is taken in Baluchi Pass. You can see Baluchi Pass just up the top right there, uh, beckoning. It used to stand over the top of Taran Count. Uh, you look to the north and see Baluchi Pass. Uh, uh, big V beckoning you up to come and fight. And the uh, Chora area and the Baluchi area was enemy held territory. And there's more blood spilt, I would argue, in this, this area, more Australian blood spilt than probably anywhere else since, since probably Korea um, um, uh, in, in one area. And uh, this evening we, we were relaxing, we'd done some vehicle maintenance and, and communicating and, and whatnot. We're just relaxing playing cricket, which we did a lot. Uh, cricket has this fantastic way of bringing people together and a few laughs and unwinding everyone, um, as you could imagine. And uh, only hours after this, we took off at first light, only half a dozen hours later. And the car that I was driving was ambushed in, a, in an improvised explosive device, detonated, we were ambushed. And the, and the guy who took the photo, Sean McCarthy was killed. And you might, you might know this image from the front cover of my book. Uh, and uh, Sean's legacy looms large with me, a close mate sitting right beside me, literally uh, standing just behind me, was killed instantly in the blast. I was wounded and sent back to Australia from the wounds. Um, and this, this image, I think, again, it, the gravitas of this image is 
the fine line between rest and respite and fun and the, the you know that mon the mundaneness of of soldiering and then punctuated by moments of terror and in this case yeah unfortunately we lost um, we lost Sean's which was as I said unfortunate uh, but these things happen what I don't like about this photo is these guys down the right hand side here or the Afghan National Army they're all sitting along here waiting to have a bat everybody knows in backyard cricket you have to feel before you get a bat so get off your bloody asses and get out and have a field you lazy bastards but cricket, um, yeah, cricket. So, so what about cricket? You know, this is a, a shell green. Um, you, everyone would have seen this image. Um, you know, cricket was used as a ruse in, in Gallipoli to, uh, you know, to, to faint a, a scenario or an environment where everything was normal. But while they were playing cricket uh, at shell green, the Australian withdrawal was underway and the Turks were tricked into thinking that the Australians were just playing another game of cricket, maybe bomb them, whatever. Uh, but it was used as a ruse to, to show that situation all normal. And there's another great photo. I, I, uh, I thought it was on here, but I haven't got it on here, of a picture of a guy by the name of Tibby Cotter who, uh, who's smashing one over cow in the, in, the, um, in the shadows of the Sphinx and the, the, the pyramids in Egypt. And Tibby Cotter is a guy I've kind of become in, intrigued with. You know, he, he played, I think, uh, you know, a dozen or 10 or 20 games for Australia, he was touted as the fastest bowler Australia's ever had, uh, represented Australia. And he went off to war, uh, signed up in, in, for World War I, and he was killed in, the, in, the, in Beersheba, in the aftermath of Beersheba, uh, picking the dead off, retrieving the dead and injured off the battlefield. And Tibby said, you know, I'll go away, but I'm not using a gun. So they put him as a stretcher bearer, and he was happy with that. He just wanted to be with his mates, but he didn't want to fight. And I respect that. And uh, I think he was maligned early in the early years for that decision but I think it's a, a, a honorable and much admired and respected uh, decision and uh, and good on him so that's yeah you know, as I've collected the bats and watched cricket and loved cricket I've, there's this other layer of of um, cricket in in uh, in service and so it was for us uh, this is us playing cricket up in the highlands of Timor Leste um, when we were up there uh, looking after Alfredo Renato. I've already spoken a bit about Alfredo. He was a bit of a gangster um, with a capital G, I would say. And uh, I spent many nights talking with him and I found him to be, as I said, a sophisticated educator. He was educated in, uh, at RMC here in Australia. His family lived here for a period. Uh, in a lot of ways, Timor was my most challenging deployment. It doesn't, doesn't kind of fit the bill, does it? It was a, it was a piece um, kind of uh, humanitarian almost or diplomatic mission in that we were just trying to secure peace so they could have uh, free elections. But it was the, the dynamism of that environment with so many internally displaced people, you know, tens of thousands of people streaming out of the hills and we were the only forces on the ground. There were gangsters and, 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 um, and soldiers running free and there was killing and looting going on. And I found it really, really challenging as a as a tactical commander to keep keep uh, to to know what to do, to be honest, and and to to react to not only the the the, the threat of violence, but also look after the humanitarian catastrophe that that played out in front of us. And for about three weeks before the ADF landed, there was only two teams. There was twelve SAS guys on the ground, and uh, it was super challenging. We had to. You know, beat people back with a stick when we were delivering, you know, meagre food rations and tents, etc. And I've I really felt overwhelmed, and I think I grew a, a, a couple of inches in that deployment, and and remember it fondly. Uh, this is us playing cricket, uh, and and I'll just go back. Just in Timor, cricket was used as a bit of a, a way to build rapport with the bad guys. Uh, and at that stage, Renato was the most interviewed. Uh, person on the planet, BBC, uh, CBS, or US, UK, European channels, they were lined up down the hill to come and interview him. He was seen as this kind of Che Guevara type of figure. And uh, we used cricket to stop them coming in so we could take photos of everybody that was coming up, kind of a bit of, bit of Hogan's heroes almost. Uh, we play a game of cricket, they'd have to stop while we played. We get photos, talk to them, take names, let them through after a ball and then so on and so forth. So we used it as a, as a as a, as a way to gain intelligence, literally. 
Here's a, a picture. This is Taron Cout just after Australia took it over from the Dutch. Uh, and we were the first on the ground here as well. There's only a small contingent of SAS, about 30 of us. And we were doing vehicle patrols, parachuting, uh, all types of things, plus trying to build a base uh, that was fit for the ADF to come and inhabit. So it was a huge job and mon monumental. And when I think back to the kind of work we did, we were digging, we had graders, we got graders up and running and we were building barricades and we built towers. And, and then we also did our missions outside the wire. I don't know whether, I don't know how we slept. Um, and we also were, were, were a first aid station and, and, and a, uh, a suicide bomber detonated in town, killed dozens of civilians at a dogfight. And we were overwhelmed with uh, literally hundreds of people stormed into the camp, which we hadn't quite built. And we were dealing with some very traumatic um, uh, injuries and dying people and had to triage and, and, and cool room a lot of people. And it was, I just remember this evening, we were just so gassed. We, we were just all completely um, shot. Dying kids is hard to, to kind of stomach. And we were very, very low. And I, I thought, I didn't know how we'd get back. And a mate grabbed a bat, grabbed my bat, grabbed the ball, went out. And before long, this game broke out. And you could just feel everyone unwind. You know, there was a, a, a wicket, an LBW appeal and a sledge and there was a laugh. And I just grabbed my camera and started taking photos and, and video because in front of me were these, I would say, depressed, tough men who, who couldn't find, um, you know, an answer to what had been happening over the last weeks. And here they were laughing and unwinding. And I thought cricket really has this magic that, that, that another sport doesn't have. If it was a football or, a, or kicking a footy around, it just doesn't have the same kind of inclusiveness where everyone gets a bat, everyone gets a bowl, everyone gets the field and, and keep. And, and cricket again became loom large in my life as this kind of therapy. Uh, and on, in this image, that's exactly what it is. Cricket is the therapy that's uh, bringing everybody back to humanity. Uh, it wasn't all serious. Uh, this is us playing a game in the uh, Cod Valley, way behind enemy lines. We used to go up there and taunt them on the radios and, and, and uh, pick fights with them. Uh, you know, we'd fight during the evening, pull back to the middle of the valley. This valley is, you know, 10, 15 kilometres wide and, and 30, 40 kilometres long. Pull back out of gun range, do our vehicle maintenance, do our communications, and we play cricket. And pretty rough deck, I, I hope you'll agree. The, uh, on a good length there, you'll see the rock that we, we, um, we carried around. We always placed it on a good length in the, uh, in the uh, games we had. And on this particular day, we were playing and we used to monitor the bad guys on a Motorola radio. You just buy it off the internet and that's all they had. That's what they used. And they just used code, code words. They didn't have any encryption at all. And you just go to channel 17, surf the, surf the channels and the interpreter who was listening into the bad guys talking and getting themselves ready to attack us. He said, they're watching you play cricket. And I said, oh, is that right? You know, what, what were they saying? He says, oh, they reckon they're, you're rubbish cricketers. And, and so they're sledging us. And this Taliban commander, I said, is that bloody right, is it? Well, let's get on the radio to him and tell him, come down and play us in a game. And there was this pause. And I thought, bloody hell, they're thinking about it. And what are we going to do if they say, yeah, we'll come down for a game, you know? Uh, of course, they didn't. They, they denied and said, oh, well, if we come down to play cricket, you'll bomb us. And that's true. We'll call the planes and, 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 and bomb them. But it's just curious that... Uh, you know, we're playing cricket and it caused the, the foes to kind of come together for a moment and contemplate and talk about cricket. It was the common theme. And uh, I'll, never, I'll never forget it, obviously, but just uh, it just goes to this other level uh, of, of uh, engagement. It, it harked back to memories of, you know, the, the Germans and the English in the trenches coming together, uh, apparently to play cricket, but they shared, we know that they shared cigarettes and sung songs together. And... Um, you know, soldiers, we're not, a lot of people treat us like we're dumb soldiers, just go off and do as we're told. But I think at the end of the day, the soldiers, you know, notwithstanding all of the trauma and tragedy, we're not that dumb. We know, uh, we know that um, we have a, a respect for each other, no matter who the foe is, that we're all in that kind of milieu, if you like, of, uh, of warfare. And just love the idea that cricket could bring us together for that moment. Um. A couple of, you know, I talked earlier about long range uh, vehicle patrols and our capability to do this. 
And just before that game or just after that game, it was uh, this this image captured just in the afternoon. We'd we'd spotted some bad guys up in the hills. They were hanging around some graveyards and terrorising one of the villages. And this is us lining up ready to go into battle lines. And so we would pick a piece of dirt just behind a, a, a in a bit of lower ground, uh, form up, get ready, and then we would charge at the villages, uh, line abreast. And there's nothing quite like uh, five or six vehicles line abreast 50 metres apart, um, charging over the, the, the desert for you know, up two or three kilometres and engaging the enemy and, and making them um, split and panic. And that's what you want. Once they're panicking and on the run, then we've got them. We can track them from space, et cetera. And I just, I, I, I guess my fondest memories really of Afghanistan are not the parachuting not the secret squirrel missions at night, although they're all stories and they make part of the fabric. But I, I remember being in, on vehicle operations in the desert. There's just something about the autonomy and the, the uh, independence to act tactically that I, I, you, you just don't see in normal military actions. And operating behind enemy lines actually is, it sounds hard and it sounds tough and it sounds kind of, you know, cool. But it's actually a great place to operate when you can dominate the the battle space and where you can instill fear into the enemy such that uh, you know brazen actions like we would carry out were were comfortable to us and we were happy in the chaos we didn't need order we didn't want order we wanted to create more chaos because we were comfortable in that and felt uh, as a unit as a small unit that we could operate uh, with you know with, uh, with autonomy and make decisions. And, you know, uh, the SAS is well trusted up the chain of command to get on the effects. And we always, always uh, deliver more than we, than we promise in that respect. And I think that this image kind of really, really captures that. I'll put this in here for a bit of fun. Uh, this is my backyard cricket uh, deck back at uh, Willoughby, where our family home is in Perth. Uh, I'm living in Melbourne now. I, I hope you'll agree that that's the best backyard cricket deck you'll ever see. Uh, many hours of curation has gone into that. Um, might be a, the odd uh, fag end or a bit of beer and a heel from a boot on a good length there so that um, uh, the boys don't get it too easy. This is me playing a game with a few of the the, uh, the regiment guys and some civilian mates raising some money for muscular dystrophy on this day. And that's Carrington Shepherd about to hit his 100th run in a legitimate backyard cricket uh, ton. And uh, they're very rare and few and far between. You'll notice the ropes on the boundary just in front of the chook pen at the back there. They're, um, they're fast ropes out of helicopters. You've seen guys sliding down ropes out of helicopters and we got the old disused ones that weren't serviceable anymore and I used to uh, uh, take care of them and use them as boundary ropes. And, and I put this on here because backyard cricket has become something that I'm super passionate about now. I've all, I'm organising backyard cricket games around Australia to raise money for education in places like Afghanistan so that we can breed a generation of educated uh, people that can hopefully lead their nation uh, out of the, the, the troubles that they find themselves in. And we need educated uh, young men and women to do that. So that's a, that's a fight I feel like I can continue to give here in Australia and support. And not, not to mention, we've been helping behind the scenes to get uh, Afghan people, particularly those who have served with uh, coalition forces back here, repatriated and resettled in Australia. And that's something I'm really proud of uh, that myself and, and the team that we're involved in continue to do. Raise money with backyard cricket, help Afghan, Iraq, whoever, uh, war-torn countries i can't think of a better way to to kind of now move into my civilian life and what is that well my civilian life now i, I left the sas in uh well I, I left the sas in 2019 but i moved over to melbourne in 2016 with my wife and kids and uh, finished my master's degree in psychology and registered as a psychologist uh stoughton on the right there uh that's um percy Serides. Uh, philosophies, Stoughton philosophy, 
Uh, so I, I, for now, that's the name of the business. And we provide psychological services, not only for mental health, but also for performance in sports and corporates, et cetera. Um, I'm also a director for the Mission Critical Team Institute, which I'm really proud of. Uh, we work globally across US, UK, Europe, uh, Australia, New Zealand, et cetera. And uh, we provide training and leadership development for uh, first responders, fire, medicine, police, military, uh, and these are the these organisations have shoestring budgets. They have nothing, and they have they're, they're so operational and so overloaded all the time. The governments are almost making cut, cuts. So we've we've got an organisation now that travels all over the world um, and delivers training and courses for for very cheap for these organisations. I've worked with um, with the fire department in New York. Uh, work with uh, you know, intelligence agencies in, in the UK, militaries all over the world, and uh, helping develop the next generation of, of military and first responder um, of leadership, men and women. And it's, uh, again, just a great privilege to be able to give back in that way and help them out. Uh, as I said, they, they run on an oily rag, these organisations, so it's great to be able to, to help them out now that um, I'm, I'm pretty settled. You know, the future for me, I really want to, I really want to uh, continue in these lines, raising money, raising awareness and training um, these, these, uh, the future leaders who are important. COVID's brought into stark relief how important our, our front first line responders are and how important it is, uh, we saw with the fall of Kabul last year, how important it is to make sure those future leaders have got some kind of grounding and a voice that we can help them with, even from Australia or the US, we can still help them. Uh, inside their country, notwithstanding the, the terrible challenges that they that they have in, in places like Afghanistan. So that's the future for me. Uh, I'm going to bleed into my retirement doing that. And uh, hopefully retirement's not too far away. I'm feeling pretty bloody tired, to be honest, and, um, and have a bit of time off when I get a chance. But uh, I live here in Melbourne with my wonderful wife, Danielle, who I need to mention. She's been along the journey and she's put up with all of this rubbish for <laughs> For 25, 26 years, I owe her such a debt of gratitude and I'm really focused on uh, yeah, making this next, probably last chapter of our life uh, together and really important for her uh, as much as I can. Uh, and I think we'll stay in Melbourne. Uh, that, that's pretty much it. I think I've, I've, I've done uh, about uh, 35, 40 minutes. So thanks for listening in. I hope you get a flavour of, uh, of, um, of, of me. Uh, and my journey and also what's in the book uh you know i would it's the books received great feedback on which thank god <laughs> i'm relieved more than anything and i think it reads well uh, i certainly haven't had any feedback i think we're looking towards thirty thousand sales and i understand that's pretty solid in australia and i think it tells an honest uh account of what it's like to kind of go through not only the sas but a, a life of service in the military and um and for those who have read it thank you and for those who might be thinking about it uh thank you as well and uh, i hope you get something out of it but uh again thanks very much for, for having me and i'm really happy to talk about anything from cricket to sas to anything else nothing's off off uh off um off the table so uh with that, Brent, uh, thank you, and uh, I'll hand it back to you. You might need to unmute. <laughs> ha! <laughs> Forgot to unmute. So excited. Um, uh, Thank you very much, Harry. Very interesting. Um, we've, we've got one question and then probably if we don't get any more, we'll go to open mic uh, from John, John saying um, the picture shows 12 cricket bats. Uh, what's their story? Is there a, an individual story about them that um, you can bring up? Or Yeah, sure. Let, let, let me just share the screen again. And um, so... I guess let me talk to the twelve bats first. So that I, I'm glad someone picked that up. And um, I was at a I was at a um, Adelaide Test match recently talking, and the question didn't come up, and uh, uh, and I was surprised. Um, so the twelfth bat here is the the GM uh, fourth from the left. But can you see my cursor, Brent? Yep. 
Yeah, so the GM here, fourth from the right, is the blank bat. And you might be uh, aware that at military ceremonial dinners, uh, they'll set a table for absent friends and fallen comrades. And that's just a blank space at a table somewhere in the, in the dining hall uh, that no one populates, just set up as if someone was going to sit down. So the blank bat uh, is there as 12th man, might, might be a good name for a book, uh, follow-up book, um, to remember fallen comrades and also the people who served who didn't sign any of the bats. But more than that, it's come to symbolise to me the families that were uh, uh, back in Australia supporting us. You know, one of the greatest challenges of my being a leader, uh, so-called, was not so much the missions and preparing and, and planning, et cetera, although that's it's very challenging. Um, it was keeping teams together when back home, their families might be falling apart, literally. You know, there's, you're away for so long and so many years. Some partners and families just can't take it anymore. And they want to, they might be, they might come from Townsville, but they're living in Perth. They don't have the social network. So trying to keep soldiers' minds on the game while they're away and deal with family issues, financial issues, all those social pressures is a real challenge. And trying to get uh, help to uh, the families uh, who are missing their husbands and partners is a real uh, a real challenge so you know, I like to think that that symbolizes the challenges that the partners families friends uh, families and, and particularly children too we kind of miss out a lot on the children in the narrative as much as uh, you know that they do uh, they are negatively impacted from our service I know myself and my son, uh, of still building a relationship after so many years away. But um, but I'm, I'm, I'd be happy to talk to any or all the bats. Each one of them's got a story. You know, you've got uh, on the left-hand side, the first one's from Afghanistan. Uh, the next one in Baghdad, that's a handmade bat. I couldn't find a cricket bat. I didn't know I was making a collection at this stage. So I, I, I uh, made one out of, I whittled one out of a bit of 4B2 off a building site. I played that with Afghan, uh, with um, Gurkhas in, in Baghdad. Uh, Afghanistan, then there's the two Timor bats here uh, and uh, another Timor. I went to Timor twice in, in 18 months and spent a long time there. Uh, Afghanistan, um, Iraq again, and then you know, see out the rest uh, of the last four tours or last deployments I did were, were all in Afghanistan from, you know, from 0, 09, 10, 11 and 12 um yeah all six month deployment so a lot a lot of time away okay there's another um question from john did the quick collapse of the of the afghan surprise you uh not really i you know there's it's a pretty um uh hold on I might just uh quit someone screams on um i can't change that that's john hitchens screen stop sharing a bit um, um yeah so that the fall of that uh, not not particularly um look the first thing i'll say is, is is there a good way to to leave a war you know like i you know there's a lot of a lot of us have made commentary about what could have been done better um but i think i think you know, in the cold, hard light of day, it probably wasn't the worst solution that the US could have come up with. I mean, how do you withdraw? Do you rip it off like a Band-Aid or do you do it slowly over a period of time? Um, the, the, the fall of Kabul, not surprising. Um, the Afghan National Army were, you know, got to, got to give them some credit here. You know, they lost more people. They fought harder, longer than, than any of the coalition forces. And some of them still do today, you know, up in the um, Panchia Valley and that they're still fighting. The Taliban are still trying to seize that area back. But when 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 the panic went through the ANA, the, the Afghan National Army, it, it spread like a, a cancer. And, and of course, most of the soldiers, the coalition forces had placed uh, soldiers from the northwest down in the north. Uh, southeast and vice versa they, they transferred them around the country so firstly they had families they were worried about and the Taliban were doing some horrible things so they wanted to get home and defend their 
country. Uh, the other reasons, some of them hadn't been paid for months and months on end. The corruption was terrible. We, we were paying probably billions of dollars to pay these soldiers, um, but none of the money was getting through. So they'd had a gut full anyway. They're going, we're not getting paid. And they were probably on the verge of collapse in many parts because they hadn't been paid and were all looked after. They were living in horrible conditions, some of these Afghan soldiers. And the other, the other aspect to this too is that um, the Taliban were always there. You know, it's not, we have this mental model that they all got pushed out to the fringes and then they came back in. The Taliban, you know, cast your mind back to Vietnam, they lived amongst us and them. So they were always there. It was just, they were like figures in the carpet. And once the fall started and they were empowered and encouraged, they just appeared and they were farmers and they were, you know, they were sympathisers and they were hardcore, hardline. Um, and, you know, also the, the rural people gave into it because they they just want to get on with life. So whoever's in charge, they don't care. They've had the Russians, they've had the Taliban, they've had the bloody ISIS or whatever. So, so I wasn't surprised because all of those conditions make for a quick, uh, a quick takeover, if you will. The media portrayed it as front lines and they were creeping in here and it's, it's just bullshit. The, the Taliban were there the whole time, all through it. I was crawling around Kabul in plain clothes, tracking you know, dozens, hundreds of Taliban and they were just going about their lives normally in waiting. And they knew if they held out for 20, 30, 40 years, that they'd be back on. And so when the Taliban come to power, they had the money and the power and the guns and the and the, um, and the networks. Uh, it's a bit of a no-brainer for, for locals just to kind of switch allegiances or, or, or just stay as they are, just go about business as normal. Thank you. Um, Graham asks, he, he says he notices that the bowlers were using tennis balls with no cricket balls available. Uh, yeah, great question. So, no, cricket balls were few and far between. Um, tennis balls are just cheap and, and don't take much weight. So, um, you know, you can put in half a dozen cricket balls in your backpack and, and there's not much, too much weight to them. And, and God, we lost so many balls, uh, been hit into bloody ravines or off cliffs and uh, whatnot. So tennis balls were just very... Uh, you know, utilitarian, you know, they're, they're very serviceable. So always the uh, the tennis balls. Um, on many occasions, we lost so many tennis balls that we had to make make balls. And uh, I cover it in depth in my book, which is might be boring for some, but how to make a gaffer tape ball, uh, one that bounces, not just one that's a dud kind of filled with paper. And, uh, and so we come up with some pretty ingenious ways. You go back to the cricket games played in some of the Starlags of World War II, uh, and they stitched up, you know, I, I think I've seen one in, in the um, Imperial War Museum in, um, in London, a handmade cricket ball. And for all intents and purposes, it weighs and looks exactly the same. And they even set up nets for training and, and whatnot in some of the Starlugs that let them. Um, so we didn't go that far. We didn't have that much time on our hands. But uh, we certainly, when we ran out of tennis balls, we'd make... Uh, do with a bit of gaffer tape and, and, and uh, some rubber bands and whatnot and uh, fashion pretty decent balls. Great. Um, Peter Edwards asks, uh, firstly, he says, thank you for a fascinating talk. Um, do you agree with your former colleague, Peter Tinley, that the use of the of SAS in the Tampa incident was quite inappropriate? Was it detrimental to the reputation of the SAS rather than the government which gave the order? Uh, look, I it probably, probably on, on reflection, I think it's an easy comment to make that it was that the SAS shouldn't have been uh, used and, uh, and that it, you know, in hindsight, I think that's a, 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 a easy, easy thing to say. I think if you, if you go back to the conditions at the time, you know, two things, we didn't really have a border force and our naval forces didn't really have the boarding capacity that we have today. We see them cutting around now and our navies are uh, formidable in terms of how it can board big ships. And uh, particularly, you know, when you come alongside a, a, a tanker, although that was a small tanker, uh, it takes huge technical uh, capability and technical experience to get on board, seize the ship, take control of it and fight a fight as well. So... I don't really see what other option we had at the time, to be honest. We, we certainly didn't have a border force or any capability that wasn't outside the military. 
And there wasn't really another unit that could deploy in the shorter period of time that we did. Uh, so Pete, yep, uh, words taken, good, but he's probably missing a few uh, contextual, contemporary uh, facts uh, of uh, and being a bit political in hindsight, and that's what political politicians do. They, they tell us the bleeding obvious long after it, it's happened. So, that, so there just wasn't the conditions in place. So I think it was a, a, a decision that they could not, couldn't not make. The other thing I say too is that you know, the, the SAS up until that point were the go-to force. We've got a problem. We don't know what to do. We need to get something on it now. Send the SAS. So for every 10 times that they've gone, many of which no one's heard about, it's been the right choice. And I, I kind of think they, they probably didn't have another choice because we were ready to go. We could be there within hours. We could be on boats. We can, we can look after ourselves. Just give us a task and we'll steal the boats, steal the ropes, steal the guns, and we'll make it happen. And I think in that context, mostly more than the, the contemporary conditions at the time, it made a compelling argument for John Howard, who loved us, to go send in the SAS. Uh, not a good look. SAS guys handling um, civilian refugees uh, were not really designed to, to do that. So, yes, it, probably a poor look in the end. And there was a bit of politics around who was in the water and who was out and all the rest of it. And that's, that's But I think, again, uh, that was the force of choice. A bit of overmatch on reflection, not a good look, but I think they didn't have any choice. You know, who, who else were they going to send, really? And, and at that stage, too, the Tampa, there was intelligence that they had heavy machine guns and heavy weaponry. So, again, I think this you know, just makes a more compelling case at the time for them to probably lean into an easy decision anyway. Thank you. John asks, um, who gets the money from the drugs grown in Afghanistan? Well, the Taliban, that's why they fought so hard. They're not fighting for Islam uh, for the large part. They're fighting to protect their, their, uh, their riches. And, uh, you know, if you believe any of the, the, um, the, 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 the research and whatnot, you know, 80% of the opium comes out of that region. Um, uh, huge tracts of marijuana and opium fields. Like, I've, I've never seen anything like it. I've never seen a lot of drugs in my life full stop, but there's just tens of kilometers of opium you know kilometers wide uh beautiful they're, they're beautiful fields when they poppy and they and they flower they're just sensational and the marijuana fields is just growing wild everywhere so you know the the taliban know where their butters their bread's buttered and it's buttered with with drugs and it always has been from from probably millennia and uh and they fought hard to protect their their veins of gold so um, the money goes back to the Taliban. It probably ends up as it does in all kind of hierarchies with the top tier and um, you know, the bank accounts and living in Saudi Arabia or wherever else they go. Um, but uh, it certainly wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> um, back, back home again, um, another historical event. Should the S Graham asks, should the SAS have been used at the, at, at the Lint Cafe in Sydney? Uh, pro probably. However, we'd stood up a, a pretty reasonable capability in the PTGs and the police tactical groups and the SOG and TRUs and, and whatnot around Australia. And they're, they're an elite force. Um, and they did call in the commandos as backup and they are the Eastern TAG, the uh, tactical assault group. So that was their role. And it was a domestic role. And the PTGs, the coppers, were, were prepared to do it. Uh, they were probably hamstrung by poor leadership. Uh, it probably would have been a better result uh, for the police if the police leadership had been better. And I think some of the investigations has come out that the communications were poor. One of the commanders was in bed at, at a critical time. Um, uh, the communication between state and federal agencies wasn't as good as it could be. Uh, there was this rumour in the background that the police were going to be pulled out and they were going to send the commandos in. So there's all this kind of uncertainty and it really interfered with the New South Wales Police Tactical Group to doing their job. And by the way, they done a bloody great job. You know, storming a place like that uh, where the guys got the upper hand and going in... Um, uh, to you know to the unknown is never looks 
clean. It, it's not like Hollywood. You know, it's never like Hollywood at all. It's ugly. There's smoke and there's confusion and yelling and screaming, no matter whether it's a, a, a compound in Afghanistan or something else. Uh, you know, so I, I actually, I know those guys. They've done a great job. They resolved it. Uh, someone was killed. The, these things happen. This is a terrorist situation. You know, let's, let's, let's paint it for what it is. And it could have, it could have been a lot worse. Were, there, were, there were tactical level errors made by the police. You know, they went in with the wrong um, grenades or they didn't choose their hand grenades, their stun grenades properly, and they smoked out the place, which made it worse. Um, and they've learned from those experiences. But I, I actually think that the right result was achieved in the end in that we had a capability. Let's back that capability. Let's back them in. They did back them in, but they were they had a lot of challenges and a lot of hurdles against them, as I said, leadership, and, and uh, poor information and poor certainty around who was going to uh, affect it. And I think in the end, they achieved the mission. They saved the hostages, they, uh, they killed the terrorists and there was a person killed and a person wounded. And, and uh, uh, that's, that's always unfortunate. Um, but I think the result was not, not too bad you know, in, the, in, in hindsight. Um, I know that's probably not of much comfort to people who were close and family, et cetera. But, um, you know, these things just, just as a fall or withdrawal could ball, these things just don't play out how we want them to after the fact. Uh, there's no way, no great easy way to resolve a terrorist situation, no easy way to end a war. And I think we just need to keep the current context, backcast to the current context, the contemporary context at the time. Uh, and I can assure you that I work closely with SOG and TAUs and, and the others around, the, around Australia. And they are elite and they've got our backs and they're very good at what they do and they're getting better all the time as the SAS are. Tremendous. Thank you. Uh, I did promise an open mic if anyone wants to do that. We, all these other questions have obviously come through on the chat. Does anyone have um, anything they'd want to ask verbally? No? Okay. Yes, I do. Yep. Okay. Took, took me a while to unmute. It's Ian Lilly here. Harry, okay, great talk. Harry, great away. talk. Thank you. Um, I had my 34 years in the military, no time with the regiment, of course. Uh, I get asked almost daily by my peers in Melbourne about, you know, what's going on with, with the case with Ben Robert Smith, but the regiment, you know, SAS. So from your perspective, and your bank, should we be worried about the regiment? Have they got an issue or... Is it just uh, uh, isolated cases, media having fun, uh, uh, and they'll get back to what they do well? Well, yeah, the, so the, the regiment continues. I, I'm, I'm super proud of the regiment to be able to operate at the level it's continued, and it's still the hardest working organisation, I think, in Australia. Uh, so one I. Uh, and, uh, and so they've continued to work. Uh, the regiment's just focused on what it does. It's a it's a large beast now. Yeah, there's a, a thousand plus people working there. Um, uh, several hundred operators who do most of the heavy lifting, and they've cracked on. Um, the allegations uh, need to be tried and need to go to court. We all agree with that. Um, yep. uh, well, for, for the majority of the regiment, I speak daily, hourly, sometimes with guys in the regiment and involved in the investigation. And that needs to play process. I can't really talk to whether I think um, it's a isolated um, incident or not. There's allegations pending a small group of people. That's all I would say to that. But what I can say Ian, is it's not my experience of the unit. And I was as shocked and, and hundreds of us were as shocked uh, when it first came to light. And it came back, you know, as, as far back as 2013, 14, that it came to light. Mm. And it was raised in sight. Concerns were first raised inside our unit, not, not by the journalists, not by the politicians, not by external bodies. Concerns were raised in our unit and that was what triggered a deeper investigation. And unfortunately and shamefully uh, as a unit and for me as well, it uncovered what uh, some horrific allegations. Now, anyone who's read the Brewer report, even the redacted model that's available, the redacted version that's available, anyone who doesn't have the hair stand up on the back of their uh, neck reading that, um, it, you know, does, can't feel, frankly. I, I think if you read that, 
you must come to the conclusion that it needs to be investigated. And what I'll say about the unit is that we all stand ready to be accountable. But no unit or no organisation, I believe, should be held in, in higher, to, to a higher account than what we should. It doesn't mean that everyone needs to pour over us and come in and, and, and stick their fingers in what we're doing or know what we're doing. Uh, the, the secrecy needs to remain. And, and for good reason, we, other coalition partners depend on our, our diligence and our discretion, but we should be held to account at the highest level. And in, so if someone's done wrong and someone has committed the crimes that have been alle you know, um, alleged, then we need to remove them out of the system and out of the unit because they're bringing our unit down. That's, that's yeah. what I'd say. But what does stick in my craw, Ian, is the trial by bloody media and the speculation yeah there's no doubt innocent people that i've written about this in the australian anyone who wants to look up i've written a couple of articles i've got a part three coming out soon uh you know the amount of collateral damage we've lost dozens of soldiers who have left the unit or been um uh, what do i say moved out of the unit or encouraged to leave the unit 15 20 year veterans of the sas because they've been associated with someone seen in a photo, whatever, to me that sucks because we're losing so much corporate knowledge and, and experience out of the unit because of association. And that's where I think, whilst I don't blame the leadership for any wrongdoings yet to be proven uh, because you can't see everything, uh, but what they have done is they haven't led. No one's come out to defend the unit. There's not a single, one single mm. voice has come out to say, defend the unit's honour to defend our track record, to defend the, the, the nearly 100 years of service that the regiment's given, yeah. the, you know, the thousands of family, children, and my forebears who are, who, who are, uh, are starting to leave us now, the 80 and 90 year olds and, and everybody else, our legion of community, no one's come out to speak about them and say, mm -hmm. just because this appears to have happened or it's alleged these allegations have come out, we'll see, we'll trial that, but what about the families and them? And I've heard of kids in schools being niggled by other kids, being called murderers, your dad's murder. And that's just unfair. That's that's mm. unwanted, given the sacrifice that those uh, that's ironic, fathers, isn't it? fathers, partners and children make. So I, for one, uh, as, as little as I can do, have decided that I want to give a voice to that and I'll stand and defend the unit. Uh, the unit does an amazing job. It's an amazing place full of amazing men and women. It still is today. I speak to them all the time. And we yeah. should support the people who need them as well as see through these allegations. It's, uh, it's ironic. I've never, there, there's so many senior officers from the SAS throughout the military now that are uh, speaking out. Just, I'll finish it. To get off the regiment, do you think the regiment was overused or the individuals in it were just like six and seven tours, same place, same baddies? Um, yeah, I think that the commandos and the SAS were really... Uh, we're overused, you know, in hindsight. Mm. But but I'll, I'll temper that, Ian, by saying that, um, you know, if we look at it temporarily, in, in maybe 2007, eight, when we started, I started to see the first fissures of, of fatigue, et cetera. And I, I talk about this in the book as well. Um, uh, no, no one was saying no. <laughs> None of us were going, oh, no, I'm tired. I'm not going. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when the call came, we're going, yeah, well, let's go again and go again and go again. So... Again, I, I kind of moderate the the commentary around they were overused and and you know going back to Pete Tinley, there's been a, a legion of people saying oh they're overused and what a disgrace. It's armchair politics, it's armchair reflections. Um, at the time, we were our own worst enemies. We 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 were saying I want to go back. I was one of them. You know, yep. I was tired. My family had, had a gut full, and I didn't care. I was selfish, and I just wanted to get away again and go and fight. And uh, so there's two parts to this, you know, we, we, there's a, the, 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 we were overused, yes, but we certainly didn't put our hand up and say, oh, I think we've, we've gone enough this time and used someone else. The, the detriment in all of this, I think the lesson to be learned out of this is that we didn't back our infantry enough. Our infantry are some of the finest infantry yeah. on the planet. Yeah. I, I love our infantry. I'm infantry before I'm SAS. And infantry, I'm so proud of being infantry. I've just got a tingle up my spine. We really let our infantry down and we should have been using our infantry. They, they are capable of helicopter operations. They're capable of sniping operations. They're capable of reconnaissance. They're capable of all of the things that we were doing in the end. And we just 
kind of parked them on the side. And it was, it was, I think, regrettable, frankly. Uh, and I hope that's the lesson that we learn out of this, that our infantry, some of the best infantry that, uh, that's ever been seen in the history of, yeah. of humanity and uh, and they sat there for the last few years mostly sidelined and I think that's mm -hmm. where the failure of leadership uh, kind of occurred if you want to put it that way I better get a copy of the book thanks Harry thanks Dan. thank you um, there's one other question coming on the chat um, Peter says uh, Peter Thompson says what has been the involvement of officers in the current events involving been RS. They seem to be conspicuous by their absence of mention in the media. Yeah, oh, look, I, I won't lie, it has been a bit disappointing, uh, particularly the commanders at the time. I'm sure some of them are uh, can't speak out because they're potentially involved in, in the ongoing investigation, which I need to remind people, no, no one, including RS, has been found guilty of a single thing at this stage, and we need to let that play out and let Ben defend himself and everybody else that's um, on on, um, uh, on charges or, or has allegations against them. But I have been personally, and I don't mind saying it, I think I've alluded to it in my, my uh, articles, that there has been uh, a, a lack of a voice from the officer class. Uh, I've got my own personal opinions on that, which I'll keep to myself. Um, but I, yeah, I've have been quite disappointed. And some of them are my close friends and remain so. Um, but one thing I can say is that all of us, including officers, OR, senior NCOs, we've been uh, in, in the networks I'm involved in, very supportive behind the scenes, and they're not missing there. Uh, I just think I, I'm not too sure where that plays out as a psychologist. You know, some people. Uh, you know, fear loss more than they uh, favour gain. Um, so there's probably some psychology involved in decision making and where they position themselves. Um, but the support behind the scenes has been excellent. I, I would like to see a couple more of those senior officers stand step forward and defend the regiment, um, as uh, many of us senior NCOs have. Uh, you know, one thing I'll say about the, the, the you know, there's always been criticism that the that the joints run by bloody sergeants and and that's a bad thing. Uh, bullshit. Um, the the unit is run by some of the most remarkable uh, senior NCOs that, that that the ADF has to give, and they all acquit themselves with uh, excellence. And they have rallied behind the scenes to um, to uh, speak to politicians, speak to decision makers and make it well known, I can promise you uh, how, uh, how uh, our position. And um, so I'm really proud of, of those guys. You know, the other thing we've got with operators in particular, the ORs and senior NCOs, a lot of them are still serving. So we don't, we don't expect them to come out and step forward. I'm in a privileged position, I guess, of, of sorts that I'm out and written a book. Uh, and I don't comment much about those allegations in the book. I allude to the pre, 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 pre um, you know, the preamble to that maybe. But uh, I feel that I, I, I do have a bit of a voice, and I can uh, lean out and say, you know, defend the regiment, which uh, I've already stated I'm, I'm committed to doing. Can I ask a question, uh, Harry? Somewhat related. Well, in fact, very related to what we're talking about. But from your perspective as a, a psychologist. Uh, and an Australian, do you think perhaps um, we've sort of lost focus on the presumption of innocence when it comes Definitely. to... It? Yeah, I think in this mad world of bloody social media and all the rest of it, the trial by media is inevitable. Uh, and uh, once the media get a, a hook line, uh, they're off to the races. So, yeah, it's really unfortunate. Uh, I feel, I do feel for Ben and, and others... Uh, to be, you know, just hung out really by the media um, before they get a chance to defend themselves. So I, I as I said, look, well, he's a big boy. They've uh, they've got a task in front of him. Um, he's uh, he's he's a big man, a big spirit, and uh, he's courageous. And there's no doubt about that. Uh, and he will, and a brave character. 
Uh, he sh I, I wish him all the space he needs to defend himself against the allegations and, and anyone else who does as well. And it's a real pity that the, that the media are, are making such a spectacle of it. You know, they, the media have been guilty of tearing the, the, the kind of community. I talked about the network behind the scene. Really, you know, they're in there kind of niggling and tearing apart and, and uh, you know, they've hung some of my close mates out to dry in the media with imagery and stuff like that, as they do. Um, which is really unfortunate. A bit of dirty media. And so that, that, as I said, kind of sticks in my craw. You know, it's, it's a strange kind of tension because, you know, in a lot of ways, as a soldier, you go away to defend the values of a nation. The freedom of the press is one of those things that's sacrosanct. You know, it really is important. I don't think we can place too high enough value on our, our protection of freedom of speech and, and freedom of the press. Um, what, I th what lets me down, Jason, is the media have a massive responsibility and no one to hold them to account for it. And I'm not sure what that looks like because that's the tension Orwell kind of, of course, balances yeah. with uh, and talks a lot about in his essays and, and uh, his commentary on the Spanish War and, and, and some of the great you know, uh, writings this tension between, you know, the freedom of speech and freedom to act and freedom, freedom, freedom versus how do we hold that freedom to account? Because we can't all be just running around doing what we want to do and saying what we want to say. Uh, and I guess that's the journey that Western democracy has been on and remains on. How do we balance that? So I just I just ask some of the people in the media to buddy, pull their heads in, have a, have a think about, you know, the impact more largely on families and and that and it's okay you can make you can make sophisticated intelligent commentary uh, and still have uh, a, a, a balance you know strike a balance um, but mate you know as well as I do it's all about money and and accolade and ego and so they're, they're going to push the limits with no one to help hold them to account no, no one holds our media to account not a, I don't know a single agency that does a job except for media watch that's probably about it that's, that's all I know. Well, uh, yeah, I, I think that brings to the point that you, you also mentioned about your colleagues who have left the regiment or and suffered because of this uh, attention. Now, obviously, those who have done wrong need to be held accountable. Um, is there a way that the regiment can find that balance? Can 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 the has the regiment been able to expel or, or remove or investigate its own bad elements? Uh, you, oh, absolutely. The soul searching and uh, initial investigations were pretty extensive. And as I said, you know, this, this emanated from the unit. That's where the concerns were first raised and then the um, investigations and then the outsiders came in. Uh, and, you know, to a large extent, that generation has been obliterated, uh, but mostly by association. You know, I, I wish, I really hope, and I'll say this to guys, you know, go away, have some time off and maybe you could come back in a training capacity. We've lost so much, but it, but it's amazing. You know, uh, the, the regiment uh, holds a selection course every year that has about 150 people front off from a, from a couple of thousand that go for the first filter, 150 people turn up. There's more people beating the, the, the doors down for the unit now. So I, I have absolute 100% lock uh, confidence that the people coming through now, we'll train them up, we'll get them going again, and we'll we'll bring through the next generation. Uh, there was a massive outflux or out, out um, um, a massive. There was a, a huge number of people left the unit in the late nineties, and we were worried then. I've seen this before, and I've had the, the, the I've been there over three decades, uh, so I've seen it before. That the Black Hawk accident really gutted the unit, and a lot of people left after that, and we regrouped and reformed and cracked excuse me, cracked on. So I, I don't think we have a deficiency in capability. And in fact, in some ways, a, 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 a fresh injection of this nature is going to benefit the, the unit because we're picking people who are, are, are ready for that role. But it's just such a pity. Some of my very, very close friends who have amazing uh, corporate knowledge and experience and would, uh, would be great mentors to those new leaders coming through and great training models and role models. Uh, it's just a great, a great loss. And for them to, you know, to, I, I was, I've been so lucky. I, I, I batted until I was 45, 46, you know, way past my use by date. They used to remind me daily. 
And, um, and I, I was able to leave the unit on, under my own terms. Um, these guys didn't get that privilege and they've left under a cloud and they just don't deserve it. And there's dozens of them and they are good, good men, good, good, uh, upstanding citizens. And, you know, I, it's, it's, uh, that, that, that legacy is going to take years to, 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 uh, to repair, I think. And, um, I think that that's where I'm really let down by the leadership allowing that to happen is, you know, I, I think a disgrace. Yeah, well, I guess there's an opportunity when, with as you say, with these new people coming in, that perhaps once all this, uh, all of the clean investigations and everything are done, that there's an opportunity for some of those to maybe come back in four or five years' time and 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 provide that knowledge with with a bit of luck. Yeah, we'll see. I yeah, I I, I hope so because we we do have people return and mentors and and all the old brigade come back for training and there's a lot of lessons. We're still learning lessons off the Vietnam veteran era guys, you know, still hanging around, teaching us things. So uh, I hope so. And and look, I you know, and I'd like this is where I'd really like an officer in particular to step forward and and make a public statement and say that we value your service and and we as, as unfortunate as the circumstances are. You know, we're we're sorry. I, I you know I think that would go a long way um, because they, you know, the, the overwhelming majority of these people are not under investigation. They're not caught up in any of the things. They've just um, been have a beer in their hand in a photo, or they were in a team or associated with people. And, and I just I think that that was way too far for me. Mm -hmm. okay. So I think we'll um, draw draw to a close now. Thank you very much. It was tremendous, and thank you for being so generous with your time, answering all those questions. It was great. Um, uh, so we will uh, we will uh, move on now and, and just um, uh, just talk about what's going to happen in fairly soon. Um, in the next day, few days, we will be sending out a, a three minute feedback survey. Please answer it. We always. Um, uh, take notice of it, and I'm sure that Harry will get incredible scores. Um, our next, coming up next is uh, um, Robert Hadler will be returning with a presentation called Mutineers. It's a story of events leading up to the mutiny on the battle cruiser HMAS Australia at the end of World War I, the mutiny itself, which occurred in Fremantle Harbour, and, and the uh, savage treatment of the mutineers in Australia. Um, be, it'll be presented on Wednesday, the 27th of April. It'll be another Zoom presentation. Um, and we have some exciting news. Our first face-to-face -face event following COVID will be on in on the 9th and 10th of April. It's a um, two-day conference called Hard Fought, Australia and the Mediterranean War, 1940 to 1945. It'll be at the Waverley RSL. Please look for information and registration on our website. And I'd like to remind you that our one-day co conference, the Bloody Beachheads, the Battles of Gona, Buna and Sananda, uh, which has been postponed several times due to COVID, is, being, is now due to occur on Sunday the 12th of November um, to coincide with the 80th anniversary. And let's hope it, uh, there's no reason to cancel it again. Again, look for information and, and registration on the website. Um, and uh, how do I get to the next? Um, and this brings the evening session to a close. Thanks again to Harry for a tremendous presentation and the um, uh, extra mile you went at the end of the presentation. No worries, um, Brent. Thanks very much. I'll, I'll get going, but it's been a great pleasure and hope to catch you all in person at some stage and maybe over a beer or something like that. But thanks again. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, and thanks also to uh, Jason, who keeps the things going behind the scenes, and not so much behind the scenes tonight, but generally behind the scenes. <laughs> and thanks, and thank you all for joining us. I hope you come again, and good night from, um, from the committee and myself. Thank you, Brent. Good night. <laughs>